as we cover many an insane movie and numerous cult TV phenomena. Are you ready to get jacked up? Are you with us? Then listen on. here to discuss international women's holiday we got a theme working a holiday for uh, numerous works of fiction and one of them happens to be Rosalie and Isles and it's obviously inspired by show uh Cagney and Lacey and so welcome to the show Chris thank you were you always kind of a big tv person for serving in the military and I kind of always liked the shows especially those that had to deal with women and what their professions were because we didn't have a lot of that, you know, growing up, there wasn't, even in the military, I couldn't do some jobs early on because I was a woman. I couldn't go to certain bases and that. So when I watch television, I like to see women doing some of the things that, you know, I mean, we're supposed right. to all be equal. And so it's like, right. yeah, show me some women cops and, you know, yeah, but all the shows about men all the time. Well, and before we got so heavily involved with politics and other bullshit, and it's just like, it really was hard to kind of find something where it's like, okay, the woman, well, name me a show where the woman isn't the damsel in distress or, you know, just the beautiful person, you know, <laughs> and, and um, it's the same thing with, you know, finding other minorities, you know, well represented. It's like, can we find one where they're not playing a thug this week and can they play right. a doctor and it seemed like everything pretty much had to be kind of plot devices versus it could be a naturally well-told fun story. And uh, I take it uh, with Rosalie and I was like, I guess you were already kind of a fan of both leads um, had Angie Harmon from Law and Order and it had Shasha Alexander from NCIS. <laughs> Correct. Okay. So neat. You know, I mean, and I guess you could say both shows are a perfect example of if you've already, you know, done a very winning persona, you don't really have to worry about stretching it. It'll just come naturally. You know, it's like, okay, so I'm going from one authority figure role to the next, but mm -hmm. that's fine. People like that. You know? <laughs> well, it's yeah. just like with Angie Harmon. I mean, she, she did the NCIS. I mean, the she didn't do NCIS. <laughs> That's all good. Law and Order. <laughs> she, she did Law and Order, but then she also did the Baywatch. <laughs> yeah, where she played a cop. Way back then. <laughs> and then with the Cody Banks and that, and she's always kind of been kind of authoritative kind of person in in those roles. I'm sure and she I, had a good agent too. I think she just said right up front, just like, okay, I'm not going to do these kinds of roles. I'm not going to do you know, cute girlfriend. It's like, I got to be oh. some every day kind of cool idealist you know and uh it is kind of fun just always seeing her in interviews because she would always just do the various um uh just other personas where she would kind of just have a little bit of utter dry humor or deliver a big winning speech so it's like okay pretty cool <laughs> well, just like her role in the women's murder club i mean playing inspector boxer it's like that's kind of like uh, jane rizzoli it's just <laughs> the other was in san francisco and this is in boston she's friends with the medical examiner in both and it's like wow okay and her right, personality right. is basically the same in both i mean well, she like has both. a partner you know that's been married and divorced three times in both and 
there's just a lot of similarities. So. Right. <laughs> um, and it is interesting how a show was on quite a lot for the 2010s and I was in college so I would only see parts of it and ironically the first episode I saw was like the season one cliffhanger where she gets injured by like one of the crooked cops in the shootout <laughs> like chase <laughs> spoiler <laughs> and so I'm so glad I went through it Hulu still has it on streaming and start tv air and lifetime will air rerun so it's like okay perfect <laughs> and so it's it's going to keep finding an audience people are going to find it one way or the other but are casual they will. yeah Especially, I mean, it's on HBO Max now, where Zoli and Isles is. And it's oh, like, nice. You have different generation. My 10-year-old great nieces watch it with me. Every time they come over to my house, can we watch Rizzoli and Isles? And I have to leave it right where they were because they know. It's like, Aunt Chris, we're on season three. It's like, okay, I've moved on. They're like, you watched it without us? And it's like, yeah, I've watched it like 10 times already. So, <laughs> no. It is kind of getting funny in the world of streaming now. It's like everyone's prepared to watch whatever show that they're approved to watch and, and you just come to whatever area that you want in the show and like just say it's easy to again just kind of say well I want some time to kill you know and so I I, I want to watch this episode or now I've seen it to that you guys go on it w without me <laughs> we've had to I myself have had to do chats like that it's like well you guys weren't in a mood to watch TV that night and I wanted to watch it. So <laughs> or, you, or you want to pick me up episode. And there's some really good episodes where the interaction between the two main characters just has you feeling really good about things. And it's like, so, you know, you can go to your history and it's like, okay, let me go to season three episode this and let me watch that. Cause I want to feel good. And it's and not I easy. Remember. And it's so visual where it's like, yeah, no, you just got to see. It. It's not easy to describe. <laughs> it's it's uh, heartwarming TV in the most uncanny way, and <laughs> it doesn't feel false, really, in most parts of it. I mean, even when they abnormally will solve a crime, is like, yeah, but there was some other buildup to how they just kind of how they're wired, how they. Mm -hmm. think atypically and how they're appreciated by the most atypical kind of people after kind of having on common uh childhood developments and I think that was kind of interesting because you know as a counterpoint you know I mean Lacey is kind of more of a just fun just that was one of the few shows that at that time was just kind of showing you know it was before Hill Street Blues and it was after Magnum P.I. which ironically Tyne Daly had already guest starred on a key episode of <laughs> and it's like yeah it's like those are just countering again sexism in the workplace um uh other common new york type uh level crimes where you know people were just being ambushed uh, after dark or mm -hmm. uh being threatened by unknown assailants and it's like that that show does an interesting counterpoint of just it's pretty much just a roller coaster every episode <laughs> just, and that's why it you know, when we were talking before the show, how is like some of that music is a little dated because it just it feels like something you'd hear in a slasher or exploitation movie half the time or Batman. And it's just like, well, it's not that kind of show, but I can understand where they were kind of going because that's just kind of well, how things were done back then. <laughs> right. Well, and it imitates. I told you I'm in the Atlanta area, and our former chief of police was lesbian, and she came up in Atlanta and had been there for 25 years. And she said the way that she was treated, you know, as a woman being on the police force was totally different. And so when I was researching her and it's like, wow, that's totally different. I mean, she had the whole, you know, the other dynamic of being, you know, lesbian, but just being a female on the force and rising through the ranks. And she commented in one article how she didn't, she never made detective and she wanted to be a detective, but you know, it just, it didn't happen for her. And she ended up down the road being chief of police. And it's like, it's just, you know, you can watch the different progression. And so I think the TV shows try and show that too and show the dynamics with the husband. I think it was Harvey on Cagney and Lacey. I think, you know, her husband, didn't he lose his job at one point? And so she was the breadwinner working and yeah. trying to support the family. They never show his job, but yeah, they kind of just give you a hint. It's like, uh, yeah, so right now his job is to put food on 
on the table for her when she comes in here or he has to decide well let's go to the restaurant and eat out because you know, we're both hungry and right and so they're dealing with those dynamics that actually happen in the real world and they're trying to bring you know all that up in the show and I really yeah. got to say, both shows really do a good job of showing different levels of middle class and poverty without mm -hmm. being melodramatic. Like, you know, like Jane, you know, Rizzoli on the other show, I mean, it shows a good job of showing how, you know, she's got to be a good example to both her brothers, one who's an ex-con who she's having to learn to get over her prejudice because, you know, she he is, after all, her youngest, you know, more mischievous brother. And then, you know, uh, the older brother is trying to be a cop just like her and she's like well are you sure okay oh I see because oh you know we love our mother but she drives us crazy and <laughs> I mean we can only see, be I with can, her a certain I can amount deal of the time with a lot of that so well, having an older brother and two younger sisters and you know you're caught in trying to be the example for those to follow and me being the oldest girl it's like I did have my two younger sisters you know watching what I was doing you know, what career I was going to go into and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it's like, neither one of them followed. Well, it's weird. We all ended up working in, a, um, for the mail, not mail, U.S. mail. I ended up working for a stint where I, I ran a post office in the military. My mm -hmm. sister worked for UPS corporate in Atlanta. And my other sister was actually working for UP, USPS. And it's like, so it was really weird that, you know, we all kind of got into a thing where we were handling boxes and mail and <laughs> nice. none of us working for the same people. And my brother was off doing drugs and alcohol and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But um, it's just weird. The, the three of us girls were all kind of doing the same thing at the same time. So uh, they all right. knew I wanted to be a cop, but it just, it never worked out for me, but I could watch it on TV and I could see the women do all that stuff. And, I learned how to shoot and got marksmen and all that kind of stuff. And I actually worked for the cops in the military. And so I was able to take some of that training that I got with them and from what I saw on TV and that, and so it's kind of weird. Nice. Or kind of, and neat at the same time. So. Oh, that is neat. Um, and I actually had a pal, uh, Jeremy, who I'll name drop a few times on this, these kind of episodes. Uh, he was also a military cop. So he decided, yeah, he's like, I'm not going to do just kind of, dangerous missions but i'm totally gonna you know patrol a base make sure everyone's in their bunk you know by a certain time <laughs> not doing anything mischievous on the base and but I'd like just uh, congrats on working for the postal service because you know it's it can be a good job and it's not easy to get into for everyone i i definitely tried out for you know all all those companies multiple times and just always got denied or just never got a call back and it's it can be kind of just a relief to just make sure that you are shipping, you know, approved uh, material and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, people are able to communicate because there's people who still, you know, communicate the old fashioned way, which is by postcard. <laughs> yep. Snail mail. Yep. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, very, very true. I mean, it just kind of just, they both just show you all that family dynamic, how it's like, I mean, in season one of Cagney, they show how it's like she and Lazy are just both respect each other, but also need some time away from each other. And it's like, well, I can't bring all that stress home that you emote, you know, <laughs> I got, I got to yeah. vent. <laughs> I need some normalcy first. You kind of don't know how to channel it. So you just kind of have it at all times. So come, come back to me when, <laughs> uh, you know. Well, and you've got the dynamic. One's married, you know, with kids and the other's single, and that's mm -hmm. totally different. We're in Rizzoli and Isles. They're both single and both kind of dating and, you know, doing that, but they're really close as friends. And it's like, I've actually had a friend that I've been that close to because everyone's like, oh, two females can't be that close without being, and yeah, you can. <laughs> uh, yeah. And it, if anything, these shows do a good job just kind of punching through just the stereotypes and bullshit that you know, uh, like, uh, they even, you know, when they come across even someone who's basically, you know, a rape victim or being stalked, they'll, you know, you know, they'll always shout down someone who's like, oh, they're asking for it. They're a beautiful person. I'm like, you, you guys, where do you pricks come from? That's not true at all. Yeah, you know? Totally so, a stereotype. Yeah. The, they will always correct someone in the hallway without trying to force a belief on them and just say, 
okay, you know, <laughs> well, what if that was your sister you said that about? What if that was your girlfriend, you know, your fiance you're saying that about? Would you say that then? No. Okay. Well, look in the mirror sometime, idiot. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> yeah. And I think uh, really that those shows, obviously they have a good dynamic, but you know, this was before everything had to be kind of like, you know, 48 hours or like the weapon where it would just be, you know, 48 hours I always thought were fun because they're, they would show kind of the political incorrectness of society and mix in with just uncommon partners and lethal weapon, you know, obviously that was the more popular formula, but for me, that's just kind of just really overstayed its welcome by just focusing too much on the content and not enough on the story and kind of becoming a joke of itself after a while. <laughs> despite them being worth watching at, at least once, but it's like, yeah, they don't hold up. Some of them don't hold up on rewatches because they kind of lose sense of what they are. And it's like, obviously you can, you have better luck with a TV show because you can kind of know when to say to the executives, okay, this is our final year. <laughs> uh, let's, let, let's end it here because we've done enough. And, you know, both shows lasted a good while, you know, like six seasons. That That's a great run, you know? Right. Yeah, and, six, I think, on Cagney and Lacey, and seven on Rizzoli and Isles. So. Okay, my bad. But, yeah, <laughs> I watched yeah, it all together. Rizzoli and Isles could have kept going. I mean, they could have done so much more with that. But They could have done, yeah. I mean, everything at least deserves a 10-year thing, but then there are other ones where it's like, yeah, no, this is only good for three or four years. But fortunately, they had a lot to work with. And it worked for Cagney because, I mean, it was – they were such short seasons, just constantly not sure if they'd be renewed or not, having to fight with right. executives. And the other show was just always a summer show on TNT, and it worked well because I would see it by producer my parts of it after Michael M. Robbins, the producers, uh, other shows, you know, the closer and major crimes, which had a similar kind of appeal. And I don't know if you've seen those. But yes, I have. Oh, okay. You know, it's like. Uh, and while, you know, that's just covering the L.A. area, you know, it was interesting seeing the other one just cover the Boston area and just kind of really try and cast actors who had that kind of flair and uh, ac appropriate accents and mannerisms. Um, what's your take also on um, the kinds of crimes they handle on this? Like, they do a, lot, a mix of serial killers, organized crime, and hitmen. <laughs> Well, and I like when they they drag the story. I don't like when a story ends in your hour block. It's like, I like, like with Hoyt, with Rizzoli and Isles, they drug it out. So it was actually, you know, it was covered over several different episodes in several different seasons. It wasn't, you know, just one show and boom, it was done and, you know, on to the next It was stage. a good recurring, yeah, kind of thing, right. yeah. And so when you have like a serial killer like that, you can you can have more story with it because you can you can tell the story over several episodes. Where if you just do your traditional 60 minutes, which is actually only like 43, when you get down <laughs> to it, you've got so much trying to, you know, you're trying to tell so much of the story, but yet you're trying to go for your character development and your, you know, your characters interacting with each other and that. And, and you can't do it all in an hour. Yeah, and so. they do it. They also do a good job of just kind of any storyline that just kind of wasn't going anywhere. Uh, you know, they they kind of write it out right away. Like, right. you don't know if Jane's, you know, any of her dates were gonna go anywhere. So the show does a good job of kind of experimenting and then just one and done. Okay, so <laughs> by this hour, this date didn't work out, or it was just a fun, awkward moment, and. Really, the only subplot that didn't work for me was that one serial killer who was played by Eddie Cibrian of Third Watch fame. It's like then they find he appear, reappears like three episodes later, and it turns out he's a serial killer who kidnapped her. And it's like, thank God you guys ended it there. That would have gotten too me messy. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to keep talking. No, no, no. That's fine. It's, I forgot what I was going to say. My cat jumped up in my lap so oh, okay. <laughs> move the computer she likes when i'm on uh calls to come and say that. <laughs> nice but, but no but i yeah. think with jane and dating it's like they really i mean people hated casey you know and with him going away you know in the military and all some of that to me just wasn't realistic that you know 
I don't know, when he proposed and all that, that kind of pissed me off. That was kind of where it was And then you take off and leave. And I'll yeah. agree with you. That got a little too soap opery. Is like, okay, you guys can do way better than that as opposed to stoop to that level. You know, it's like, and I mean, I like that actor. He's been good at playing a bad guy in plenty of other movies and shows, but it's like, yeah, I feel like you guys go could kind of wrap this up. I don't well, know. and I told my mom, it's like, okay, so he's home on leave in the military. Why has he got his uniform on? <laughs> I mean, if and maybe it's because of me being, you know, military background and all. But when you get home from work, you take your uniform off. If you're on vacation, do you even have your uniform with you? You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, I don't know if there wasn't all that much supervision on set for that subplot or if someone just had based it off a character they knew who never took their uniform off but it could have used a little more fleshing out um and like you say i mean it's like they kind of imply that casey's loyal to the job and yet at the same time you know wants a real life and yet at the same time i don't know if they were just trying to work around the actor's schedule because he was working on so many other things at the same time but it it did get old really fast it's like okay you're going for the cliche will they or won't they i wish you guys would just you know decide and just let this soak in a bit so we can soak it up instead of well. and the backstory that they went to school together i mean there's been a lot of debate it's like when did jane meet him was she a freshman because he was you know in the upper class and it's like but yet they made it seem like they graduated at the same time but then when you look at the reference, he's the big man on campus. Well, you can both be seniors and he can be the big man on campus because, you know, he's on the football team and, you know, all that, <laughs> where, where she's just kind of shy and, you know, off to the side. So it, it just, there was a lot of uh, uncertainty in, in the backstory. So, yeah, I, I got to hand it because the show does so many things, right. But, like especially with Jane's younger brother I mean subplots I mean those were well handled I they, thought so yeah Tommy and, was a good character right mm -hmm. and just showing you as like hey I want to do good I just wasn't as fortunate or you know mm -hmm. uh, everyone and deserves Frankie a would yeah. follow in his older sister's footsteps you know because younger siblings do that they follow the older sibling around and want to do what they're doing and yeah, and they, it knows also how to just kind of play out just the, the, uh, just the back and forth between everyone without it being misfired gags or just too much. You know, they, they know how to just really make it work to where it's both plausible and, like you say, not uh, just, okay, this is getting a little too, you know, uncomfortable, you know, because. It, you know the siblings do like each other but they don't give each other shit like you've seen in summer life i'm like that's good i'm I'm okay with you uh not overdoing it not having them just uh you know give each other grief you know because siblings do do that <laughs> they have good days bad days but it, it knows how to drag it out without it being just cliche <laughs> and right it uh, was believable yeah i mean like to say the case storyline would some there was like maybe two episodes of that that I think worked for me, and then there were others where it was like, "Yeah, where is this going, guys? You kind of just on your soapbox." So, fortunately, yeah. it doesn't factor too much. It's always like a secondary story, and I think that's the problem. It because it was a secondary story, you know, like any subplot, it wasn't the main focus. They were trying to mm -hmm. you know figure out all the other main storylines as well as the mystery of the week, and that's kind of my other main issue. Usually on a on all the other shows, the shocking like intro gets you into the show, even if you know something bad's going to happen to a victim or one of the main characters is like, but it'll overcome predictability by starting atypical or just having a gotcha moment. And that was kind of my other only issue with the show was a lot of the time someone is about to get brutally killed. And it just, I don't know, it just didn't feel like much thought was put into starting off each episode. I was like, you could skip it and you wouldn't miss anything. You're already going to see the crime scene a minute later. <laughs> right. Just a small complaint. I, I, I still dig it. <laughs> it's just one of those is like, well, if you don't want to see that part, you can skip that scene and you can go to the 
next scene and you're fine. <laughs> well, to me, it was realistic when they brought Jack in that, you know, that would really happen. Should go to teach a class and meet somebody like Jack and, you know, be nervous about dating him, Mora. And it's like, yeah. Because yeah, it's an interesting predicament because, uh, you know, when you're in a certain scenario, you don't really know how to approach everyone. So it was when, interesting. With her shy awkwardness that they kept saying she had in the show, it's like, yeah, she would be shy, you know, to date him. And she would need to go to her best friend and seek counsel and see how to do that. So that, to me, was a very realistic you know, type scenario that could happen. And I thought they did a good job of portraying that. Right. And even when she hints at her family history is like, at first you just figure, okay, they're going somewhere with it. It's like, oh, it, they really are there. <laughs> they're going really somewhere with it in terms of, you know, they are trying to figure out where, uh, you know, her bloodline is, uh, you know, her strained father, her stepdad, and who had like an affair. It's like stuff that, you know, is messy stuff that takes a while for any young person to put two and two together and say, oh, wow, <laughs> no wonder I didn't like that person or that family member, you know. <laughs> but I liked how they tied the Arthur, her um, adopted father, how the holding in that lie that he had that affair was what made her have the difficulty with telling lies and why she broke out in hives. And yeah. you know, we got that backstory later in the thing, but we got it. We found out how come she can't lie and how come she breaks out in hives and because she was holding that secret for so long. And he had no idea that she didn't know that the two parents had talked about it and worked it out. I mean, she knew they worked something out because they were still together, but her father never talked to her about it. Her mother never talked to her about it. So she was still keeping the secret all those years. Right. Uh, and it is so funny because Jane will sometimes want her to tell a white life where it's like that, to tell that person I'm not into him. Oh, but I, I can lie to him. He's a nice person. And Maura, uh, I'm telling you, lie for him. <laughs> like, yeah. It's like, I can't lie because I've been surrounded by liars. I hate liars. <laughs> I don't want to be a liar. To me, that brings up the whole scenario of things that happen in your life affect who you become and so to me it was a good and this is probably a lot of my educational psychology classes coming out but it does a good job of portraying that that event happened when she was like 14 or whatever it was and it's like here you know I think she's 37 when she finds out you know gets back with her father and finds out that that's that's what caused that all that time she's been not being able to lie and breaking out in hives if she attempts to because of <laughs> that episode way back in her childhood. Oh, so true. And I know they were based on books. I never read them, but I know the author was heavily involved. I know Janet Tamara was like one of the main showrunners and, um, you know, had previously written for Bones, The Sleeper Cell, and those, and even SVU. And it's like, that's a good start. <laughs> those are all very similar in terms of and always have psychological elements. And it was interesting too, because I think she later ended up, uh, did I see that right? No, never mind. Uh, uh, she won a Grayson Allen Award for the Alliance of Women in Media Foundation. It's like, well, mm. it's pretty well deserved. Because, <laughs> yeah, it's a very, like you say, the show feels like people who are big psychological, psychology majors, as opposed to, you know, I'm just imitating stuff I've seen on small screen and just doing more of the same. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. whether researched or not, it's like, no, no none of that is repeat of everything you've seen before because it really does and stand out. I also have not read the books. They're sitting on my bookshelf and I can see them right now. But after <laughs> hearing people say so much about how different the TV characters are from the books, and you know how lovable <laughs> Mora is on the show, but she's not like that in the books. I don't know if I want to read the books. You're right. Because I like the TV version of Jane and Mora. I like their personalities. And Jane's got that badass detective side, but she's also got that very loving, caring side that she'll do anything for Mora. And people don't yeah. seem to realize that in books, you kind of decide which character you like 
based on how they come off to you. Mm-hmm. And I've had to, you know, I've gotten so many arguments with people on books versus movies uh, numerous times. And it's just like, well, you don't get it. You decide who you want to follow. It, it uh, Five chapters comes off as just like two scenes in a movie because you only have so much time for everything. Yeah, but I want it this way. And I've had to just say, okay, you got, you don't get it. In a script, you know, one page is one minute's worth of film regardless of how it comes off in the final cut because you got to be able to have stuff that plays and you got to be able to try and make everyone happy. You know, studio picked always picks people based on, you know, what names they want to invest versus what characters would actually be way better cast Mm -hmm. as whatever character. And it it, it gets very annoying having to explain this to people. It's like, yeah, you you are not getting this. It's like the, (laughs) uh, well, look at the Bosch books. Michael Connolly, really good suspense author. You know, Bosch is now a TV show, which he is also the head, like, one of the showrunners on. And right. it's like... I love this that show. Oh, yeah, perfect. And we'll definitely do an episode on it in the future. But it's like, those are good examples. Of, I mean, I've read some of those books. Those are all about the suspense. And yeah, you get an idea of the characters, but it's going to take multiple books before you become attached to them. Well, it's like, on a show you don't have that luxury you know cable streaming or not you know it's like you got to be able to just kind of say okay this character is going to go someplace as opposed to you know in a book you generally kind of have just inner thoughts and other stuff that really doesn't becomes pretty cliche if you were to have someone just thinking to themselves all the time in a movie that would just (laughs) it would just kind of render the narrative just kind of too restricted because only you know the characters wouldn't connect and only the viewer would know everything that's going on. It it would get very cliche that way. It's like, well, in a a movie, you got to have characters interacting with each other because if they don't feel like they live and breathe the same air, then you've already rendered everything false. (laughs) Well, and I think if people hadn't told me that the books are so different from the TV show, I might've actually went and read the books but now that I know and I love Jane and Moore the way they are, <laughs> it's going to be hard for me to enjoy the books unless I go at it from a totally different spin and look at the books for the writing and, you know, for the character development and all that. Cause I oh. did that with another series, a British one called the commander. I wanted to go back and look at that and read the story after watching the TV show. And it's like, they weren't based on books. It's like, Oh, okay. <laughs> I can't go back and do that because I've been I I watch a lot of the British crime shows also. Nice. <laughs> and it's like they're a different they go into a lot more detail in some of their things than the US television series do and it's like okay, very different. So, they always have a very specific, you know, standard and formula especially with Prime Suspect which mm-hmm was kind of held as kind of a loose inspiration for the closer it was like this is kind of interesting because like like you say yeah it's like the the if the characters are so different in the book and you're just getting the vision of the actors you know perfect portrayal is like yeah i'm sorry this, the damage has been done and i mean dr drake was just a hysterical kind of british lab technician and uh who kind of becomes more involved with everyone's lives. And then Susie Chang, you know, the criminologist, she was an interesting uh, character and it just got so heartbreaking when, <laughs> you know, they killed her off and she became right. kind of a like interconnected, like two, three part episode where they're trying to figure out who killed her and why did the, what was the killer's real reason for doing it other than to lure him out. And it's like, ah, <laughs> cause that actress has also uh, been in a bunch of different, uh, sitcoms that are stuff like The Office and it's like well she did really good in that comedic role so sorry to see her go <laughs> and she was really good in Rizzoli and Isles I hated when they killed her off I mean I understand what happened to Frost you know in real life the character you know committed suicide and so they had to kill him off but they didn't have to kill Susie off you know yeah. there was the, the good interaction with her and Mora and then with her and Jane you know and it's like I just thought she was a good character and kind of 
I don't know, worked well with both of them, you know, with the detective side of the house and then the, the morgue side of the house, you know, she, she did well. Yeah. And, you know, killed her off. It's like, and then, you know, more a suspension because of it. Well, it was interesting for Maura because, I mean, you understand why she had to be suspended because now she's kind of learned to embrace life outside of the lab because she doesn't really seem to, she seems to struggle with life. But right. at the same time, I know what you mean, where it's like, yeah, they, did, they, they really did it. That, that character could have been untouched. You know, I don't know if they were just trying to break a formula where anybody is safe because they have some episodes where the lieutenant's targeted by other crooked cops in the division for political power. They have other ones... Uh, where Barry, you know, I understood why they had to kill Barry off because, unfortunately, you know, just so tragic. The actor, you know, right. that committed was sad, suicide, yeah. and they do a good job of the episode. It's like, wow, I haven't seen him for a while. Oh, well, he's been killed in line of duty, and you know, they come to the crime scene, but it's like, man, you know, it's, that had to be awful to have to insert that and change, rework everything around. Well, and when they talked to Angie Harmon and Sasha Alexander about that, they said that the um, the executive producers in that gave them a lot of leeway in how they wanted to deal with it as far as for us, the viewers, you know, and how they wanted to deal with the funeral and all that. And I thought that was pretty good because you are in a, you're a tight knit family when you're filming something like that. I mean, you're working with those people, you know, for 12 to 16 hours a day you know, mm -hmm. multiple days in a row, they are your family. You're seeing them more than you're seeing your actual family, if you're even seeing your family. Because I know Angie Harmon said she didn't see her family sometimes during filming. When she went into work Monday morning till Friday oh, evening, you Oof. know, she was Jane Rizzoli. She wasn't Angie Harmon. So, and it's like, so that would be hard to have to deal with something like that. And, yeah, and I mean, especially when some of the castmates want to hang out after the fact, you know, on the days off, it's like, oh, but my pals who I only see on set, I can't see them anymore. It's like, yeah, it's, uh, I, I can only see them now on screen or just remember the good times. And that's just terrible because very talented actor, you know, who, you know, was kind of left the Disney and Nickelodeon scene and, and you know, People started seeing him do other recurring dramatic roles like Friday Night Lies, and you're like, "Oh, well, he can really act really well." And it's like, and it, it just was another one of those where it's just like his bipolar disorder just uh, it's like he wasn't taking the right medication or something, and it's just like, man, <sighs> and, and it's another thing where people act like the signs are there. It's like, no, there's plenty of times where you don't see the signs and you can't do anything about it. <laughs> no, you can't because you're living, you're living in that time and, and you don't see it. And then sometimes when you look back, I mean, we've had to deal with that being in the military. I was in the military for 24 years and it's like, you, you deal with that. I mean, you see the people, but you don't know every single thing that goes on in their life. You know, you see them during the hours that you're together. Maybe you go out for drinks or something later and, you know, but you don't know what's going on. You don't know what emails they've gotten or what phone calls they've gotten or what's going on with their family. And all of that, as we mentioned, you know, with Maura and her father, that goes on for years. And so if mm -hmm. you don't know their full backstory, I mean, if you're not with them 24 seven, you will never know what drove them to that point. And they tried to make that come to life when Robin Williams passed a away. Very, very big example. And, and, and I mean, he was just kind of a reminder to many comedians who looked up to him, not only as a role model, but as a voice in terms of he's like, okay, you can be a good dramatic actor because in order to be a comedian, you have to have dark stuff kind of, not necessarily, it, it doesn't have to be tragic, tragic, but you kind of have to have that sense of, you know, rejection and, uh, just not just very low points in your life that you end up just kind of making funny and people laugh, you know, either at you or with you and you have to just kind of take it all. <laughs> and, and, and when, I mean, comedians always in general kind of have it rough because all the time producers are just trying to get them on movies that don't necessarily have great scripts. And it's like, well, okay, so I'm, I'm going to be start being mocked because I'm, you know, I got a brand, I got a type of formula, and 
I'm in a movie that's not necessarily showing my skills uh, where they work the best. And like, like you say, I mean, when uh, behind the scenes can be very, can either be very nice or it can be a little messy. And in this case is like this, you know, both actors and comedians can be, again, just wonderful. Just show up on time and you, you never see a hint of any just turmoil at home or I'm not having a good day. I don't feel good. It's like, well, you know, in Robin's case is like, it's like there had been hints that he had like warned certain people and he just was feeling very down and uh, everyone just thought, oh, you know, he says that a lot, you know, what, what's, what's different this time around. And, you know, with this actor, you know, just virtually no sign. He's just, hey, yeah, happy, 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 happy to be acting here. And it's like, well, mm -hmm. at home, it's it's a mess. Yeah. On a lighter note, what's your take on Vince? You know, Jane's former. I partner. liked that character. And Bruce McGill has been in everything, always being you know a political aide or you know a captain or just another everyday kind of guy. And it's just so funny how he just you know he's been in everything. You know, Animal House. Uh, uh, collateral, Muhammad, the Muhammad Ali film with Will Smith, and even uh, MacGyver of all things. So it's like see him in a more reserved kind of poncho, but with heart. That that was a lot of fun. <laughs> I noticed though in the first season or the first couple of episodes, they really made him have an accent, and then as the <laughs> show progressed, that accent went away. And it's like thank God because. It didn't seem natural to me. I mean, I know people in Boston speak a certain way, but it just, I don't know. I guess it just didn't fit him. I think it was a mix of that. Him. And too often filmmakers will just test something out when they should just really just rehearse more and just say, uh, yeah, no, that doesn't work at all. And it, should, it shouldn't take the editing room for you to figure that out. You know? <laughs> and I thought he was a good role model. I mean, I'll go back to Lindsay Boxer in the Women's Murder Club. You know, her partner, Jacoby, I said, was married three times. So you come to Rizzoli and Isles, Jane's mentor partner is a divorcee, been married three times. It's like, how, how unusual that they would mimic each other, the two shows. And it's like, that's, I mean, you wonder sometimes of the writers, if they are using those other shows. You know, in the second episode of Murder or the Woman's Murder Club, Boxer makes a comment that has to do with the TV show Prime Suspect. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Nice. Yeah, everyone has their inspiration, and that's the one. But yeah, I do kind of like that kind of paying tribute, you know. Right. And, and they talk about um, flirting with someone over a dead body in Rizzoli and Isles. You go back to episode four on the Women's Murder Club and Boxer is saying the same thing. A guy comes in and asks her to go out for coffee. And she's like, well, are you seriously flirting and asking me out at a murder scene? And it's like, so to me, that was just comical. It's like, because I remember those comments. And it's like, wow. And they really do stand out to you because it's like, yeah, someone well, had some really- And it's Angie Harmon both times. <laughs> it's not like it's her other, it's it's actually her in her role saying it both times in both shows and it's like okay <laughs> so, so they do look at the other shows and the other you know the older shows do i think um tend to lead into the newer shows so i think they do use them as a source of reference you know what worked what didn't work and you know and that's why the dynamic of the two women together worked for Cagney and Lacey oh, you know, just like you had the male version Starsky and Hutch you know you had <laughs> Cagney and Lacey and then later you're going to have you know Rizzoli and Isles and granted she's not a cop she's a medical examiner but still they're working together and solving the crimes and increasing the the closure rates you know and stuff like that because right. it, it is a team and I found that even in the military you know you have your your core group of people that work well together as a team. Well, I mean, that was kind of, that, that goes pretty much with anything. Like, cause like you say, I mean, the actor, like 
Brian Cranston is kind of doing just kind of counter roles that kind of complement his Breaking Bad and Malcolm in the Middle role, you know, just playing a different kind of concerned dad or person breaking the rules. And, and, and I mean, you even get that with SVU where, I mean, the people casted were kind of contrary to their, you know, public image that they were known for, like, you know, Ice-T playing, you know, contra controversial rapper and actor, you know, who becomes a guy who plays a cop on TV and same thing with comedian Richard Belzer, you know, he's, you know, known for being the smart ass who gets into trouble and here he is playing, you know, Mr. Reserved, you know, cynical cop. <laughs> it's like, yeah, so like, that's pretty much it. It's like everyone has to kind of play a role that's kind of complementing their real life uh, persona, <laughs> as well as, like you say, the role that they've already made immortal on TV is like, well, what's a ironic version of that role that I can play? What's a uh, enhancement of that role that I can play. Better yet, what's the opposite of that? You know, can this time can I play the bad guy, <laughs> or the version of that character who just goes off the rails, evil? <laughs> well, and they say Angie Harmon is quite the comedian too, and you know brings a lot of laughter and in that into her things. And I wonder how much of Rizzoli and Isles was actually Angie and Sasha you know, the the camaraderie that they had, you know, the friendship that they had off the screen, how much of that was brought into the show, and they just let it ride. You know, like the friendly touching and all that. I mean, was that actually written in? Or was that just, you know, um, Sasha was going to walk behind Angie, so she put her hand on her shoulder, and, you know, J um, Angie reached up and, you know, put her hand on top of her hand and they smiled at each other as Sasha walked behind her. <laughs> it's like, was that written in or was that just the two of them, you know, just being friends and acknowledging each other? I, Unless you get the actual script, which... Yeah, I can't for the life of me find anything on the behind the scenes, how stuff was filmed. There's so much fanfare and you would pretty much, if they did a convention, which I'm sure they would, I mean, they've done, I mean, Angie since then has done some animation voiceovers and I'm sure Sasha, you know, might do a comic con convention for whatever show she's doing next. But yeah, it's like, you would pretty much, if you got a chance to do a Q and a, you would totally want to ask them. It was like, Hey, you know, how much of that, you know, when the characters kind of evolved over time from the scripts versus, you know, you got into character and you just ended up adding this extra, you know, enhancement to the role or. Uh, I don't know if you've characters. read the scripts. Or if you just, you know, just watch them. But I actually have some of the scripts. And I have the very first, the pilot episode. And it is totally <laughs> different than what aired. Oh, I mean, you find the pilot episode, they have a, Jane has an older brother named Mikey. Were, were those on eBay or something? Yeah. <laughs> oh, nice. Okay. And it's like, you know, instead of having the younger brother, Tommy, it's, he's an older brother, Mike. And it's like, oh, well, I'm so glad they didn't go with that. And they made Jane, you know, she was 30, <laughs> and they made Mora in her late 30s. Well, you know, that would put them seven to nine years older than each other. Mm -hmm. Where in the show now, or well, the show, they made them where they're similar in age. They probably didn't want to restrict, you know, how uh, the age range, let alone just any other, have to keep track of any additional details. So there's like, okay, they're within similar age to each other. That's why... Mm -hmm. Maura gets along with Jane's mom and Jane does not get along with her mom and this becomes awkward and <laughs> they reconcile over time and Maura is essentially the communicator for both of them. <laughs> right, because she has that, I mean, Jane's got that caring side, but Maura in relation to the other Rizzolis kind of is like the buffer between Jane and her family and just kind of, you know, calms Jane down and, you know, does all, all right. that. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it is also kind of just annoying how scripts are, you know, when I was doing a script writing workshop, I was always still was like, okay, and by the way, all the descriptions and everything, those last just one, barely a sentence. You know, it's just that that all comes visually later with how people want to rehearse the scenes or what notes you pass on, you know, <laughs> down to the filmmakers to translate on the film. And it's like, yeah, but, you know, some of that stuff can just make or break, you know, a show, let alone a movie. It's be good to have a little extra detail and just, just so that the writers have a voice versus just becoming, I mean, 
they have it good nowadays with you know post internet when some especially some sci-fi tv writers started uh communicating with their fans i mean now everyone can answer anything you know on twitter <laughs> And it was mm-hmm. fortunately around that time when that was becoming a thing. It's like, yeah, well, that that is, that is something because it used to be you would just get complained about and you never had the writer never had a voice. <laughs> they couldn't address problems or in interviews unless they were invited to like a TV guide get together. <laughs> well, and it's nice to have the feedback. I know writing myself, someone told me it's like, well, your last chapter didn't have as much detail in it. It's like. Oh, okay. So I went back and I read the last chapter and it's like, they're right. I just, I got into like, you know, what they were saying, but not the background of what was going on. And it's like, I need to pay a little more attention to that. I need to put myself back as the the reader instead of the writer and look at how it's being displayed. or Exactly. Uh, Absolutely. uh, (laughs) Because it, it's uh, it also just makes you wonder how many other shows that kind of started out great and went downhill could have been saved by you know, someone uh, you know texting on the screen and someone seeing that tweet and saying oh no we screwed out we better <laughs> we better uh, kill that storyline we better <laughs> rework well, and that's that. That's why I mean we went my my guard unit when I was in South Carolina my supervisor was actually the military. Um, counterpart or whatever for army wife the show nice great show and similar (laughs) and it's like wow it's like i'd like to go to charleston and you know watch them film that and he's like i was a little overweight at the time i had broke my foot and put on like 75 pounds oh dear because you know he made a very sexist comment that if i was more within my weight standards he could have put me in as an extra what a prick. And I looked at him and I just kind of <laughs> took it with a grain of salt and said, yeah, I do have a weight problem right now. Even but then, then I thought also it's like there are people on active duty that do have weight problems. Yeah, you I've know, seen so. plenty of generals with a certain weight issue, let alone, I mean, if you're on a base, I mean, you could easily rework it or rewrite it. It's like, okay, someone's on retired leave or... You could be sitting down though too, where it's not as noticeable, you know. Well, especially if you're playing an extra. I mean, what are the? You're not necessarily going to be in the shot, even though you'll get paid for the day. Is like I've done plenty of extra work, and I got annoyed sometimes on certain shows when they're like, "We need this certain ethnicity." I'm like, "You're only going to see the back of my face. What does it matter? <laughs> yeah. Should I cut my hair a certain way? I mean, would that work for you?" But I mean, I I tend to pay attention to detail. Like, like I said, with Casey wearing his uniform, it's like, why in the hell did he, excuse me, why in the heck did he have his uniform? Oh, you can curse on here. But yeah, I mean, I I know what you mean, where it's like, you you didn't know where they were going with that storyline. If (laughs) that was part of the character from the get go and they just didn't expand it or, (laughs) or someone could have just said, hey, by the way, that's typically not what happens. You know, the uniform is folded up because, you know, you, he is military. You do have a certain modus operandi. You know, you. Well, I mean, home. there's very strict rules. I mean, it used to be, you know, you go to a fast food place, and it's like you don't sit there in your battle dress uniform and eat. You get your food to go. Now it's you know more laid back. But when I was in, it's like you didn't think about sitting down and eating when you're in that uniform. It's like you had to be in your dress uniform right. in order yeah. to sit down and eat. Because the whole public persona of you. Public and persona I, and any any rule bending, not good. It you can't you can't just snap out of it and just say, well, just this once. No, you know, there, there is no rule breaking, you know. <laughs> um it, and yeah, I, I I do wonder it would be cool to because I don't think there's any DVD commentaries, so it'd be interesting to see what the basis was for making that character behave a certain way was he just that distracted by jane or was it <laughs> something else going on <laughs> well like i said the the uniform it's like very few times did they have him in civilian attire and it's like no he should have been in civilian attire almost the entire every time they saw him except she did go to the va center or to the you know when he was um 
when he had his crutches and he couldn't walk and he was at work, so he should be in his uniform then. <laughs> but some of the other parts, it's like, no. He was on leave. You don't go on in your uniform on leave. Granted, sometimes you do have to travel from your destination to your leave point in uniform if you're traveling on a military aircraft and that. Because I know I've done that when I was stationed in Germany and I came home and I had to stay in uniform the whole time because I was traveling on a military aircraft. I was like, <laughs> okay, that's different. But once I got to my destination, the uniform went off. Yeah. I, I don't know why they would flub something like that. <laughs> Because probably they didn't have a military person looking over that part because it was such a small part of the show. It was. It's just, you like to think that someone somewhere could at least, you know, just like have a, uh, just a you know, relative who has that basis and they could at least run it by them and say, is that realistic? Instead of just well, it is all just TV. I'm like, yeah, but people stop watching some shows if some stuff just takes it out, them out of the whole fictional storyline they've created. <laughs> when I think as a human being, we tend to look at things that we're familiar with and we point when that's not right. They wouldn't do that. You know, just like someone said at some of the um, autopsies that Jane and Maura are doing, they would have more stuff. Their hair would be pulled back and covered and because you don't want to contaminate the body. And yeah. so if Jane walks in there and her hair's down and she's leaning over the body, it's like, you know, you have loose hair, but you know, I'm I know we're getting off the thing, but no, I mean, it's, it's fine. We're attention we're talking... to detail. Yeah. Uh some most of the time is like her hair was short and like in a bow, but there were other times where it's like, hmm, I hope you're not going to CSI territory. Because I mean, you can enjoy CSI, it's not realistic, but it kind of knows it isn't. It just creates its own comic book type storylines. Like, mm -hmm. but this is supposed to be kind of like closer in law and order, where it's like, okay, well, I'm not sure what they're doing in that episode. Did someone just not give a note? Hey, technically, you've contaminated the evidence. <laughs> well, and they were really good in the first season you know, about, they showed them actually putting the, the booties on their feet and putting the gloves on their hands, which they always had the gloves on their hands. And Jane, a lot of times had her hair pulled back in that. But when you're in the autopsy, the first season was really good about, they showed Jane having the, um, you know, the, the gown on and all that. And it's like, then as the seasons went on, it's like, no, Jane's just standing there. And however she entered, that's how she is. Yeah. Saving like, time. Or she'd come in afterwards and is like, well, technically they process the body, but how are we to know that? We don't know how this works. Well, and in real life, would a detective be able to go into the autopsy like that? Probably not. <laughs> I mean, as, as much as Jane did, probably once in a while. And, and I'd love to read how the books covered that. So maybe I should go read the books sometime. <laughs> when you're ready. When you've seen the show to death and you're ready to wreck it for yourself. <laughs> That's when, I, when I'm ready to see the reality of how the books were and say, wow, the TV really deviated. <laughs> so, like I said, I love the characters the way they are. You know, I loved Cagney and Lacey the way they were. So I don't know if that's, see, I don't even know if that was based on a book series. Not to my knowledge, but I mean, they they definitely did a good job of just kind of just, again, just making letting the leaving the show alone and letting it just process itself so naturally and same thing here you never heard any behind the scenes story michael and robbins was pretty much the producer was allowed to pretty much run whatever show he wanted at tnt and he gave janet tomorrow you know full power this was her first time you know being a showrunner of a show after being just you know a co-writer on other stuff like bones and i think bones was just a good jumping point for her just in that, you know, she's like, she knew how to blend mystery with comedy. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I'm on the third season in Bones, so I'm not a, I'm not a Bones expert, but I do like the show. Oh, yeah. I've seen it all throughout the years, and I've been slowly going through it from the get-go myself. And like, like you state, um, I mean, definitely in the first season uh, uh, of uh, Resilient Isles, you even got to just that kind of like the Criminal Minds cast that they at least had some supervisor showing them 
how to hold the guns and literally be strategic, especially with the multiple kidnappings they defuse. And especially when, you know, the crooked cops and thugs get out at the uh, gel cell of the precinct in the first season, you know, on that cliffhanger, <laughs> it's like, they did a good job of just kind of showcasing there how it's like, okay, uh, uh, the, gu- the gunplay sounds at least almost as realistic as movies like Heat. So uh, mm-hmm. everyone's reacting a similar way because, you know, I have actually been near an actual explosion like on reality shows. And it's like, it does always piss me off when I see, you know, people just walking away or getting right back up. It's like, no, you, you're unconscious. You're going to probably lose your vision or be, you know, <laughs> get some trauma on your head. Your from ears are going to ring. And- yeah, it's like they'll get the ringing right, but they'll still have someone get up right away. I'm like, uh, no, you're down for the rest of the day. <laughs> as much fun as we can have. I mean, yeah, there's some people... I'll I'll take it with a grain of salt if it's a war movie, but there's other stuff where it's like, eh, yeah, no, <laughs> there's no way that person can hold two guns or <laughs> just even have the stamina to keep running. <laughs> and I mean, you're gonna have to suspend reality on any work of fiction, but there are some some of them that just make you wonder, uh, really? <laughs> what, what? I had this. To... Oh, go ahead. But, uh, what made you think that was a good? St- idea but yeah go ahead <laughs> no i was just gonna say so on the the last episode of rizzoli and isles on the first season when jane shot herself i had to actually watch the scene several times and did she really get the angle you know right Probably so when not. you later see where her wounds are it's like is that possible and could that really you know could the bullet really do that and kill him well and i what? i had a problem with that because i don't think it would have traveled through her body like that and have enough force yeah they they never seem to get bullets and using people as human shields right on shows like that and that one not only does that technically not work i don't think but um it's kind of ruined because they play around in the editing room and make it be in slow motion so it looks even less convincing in terms of the details so it's like Mm. yeah uh, i understand where you guys were going with the storyline but i'm sure someone didn't get the continuity right or that it just couldn't work to begin with so suspend reality on that one <laughs> well, and then i think to myself it's like well i don't know enough about bullets and the type of gun that was being used you know to shoot the bullet it might have been a powerful enough because you know all all the guns are different and each glock has its different things and i'm sure it was a glock being used but I'm sure she would have still been severely injured, though, technically, for at least a season. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, and they could I, have done so much. They gapped that, you know, from the, the end of season one to the beginning of season two. Three months went by, and there was so much story, backstory in that, that they could have done. But I guess because there wasn't a crime, per se, involved in that, there was. But they just kind of wrapped things up really quick and went to the awards. Things. Yeah, I think Whoa, they, wait a minute. You could have done several episodes of that and you know I, you I, have the whole Marino story and Yeah, they, they could have at least shown is like, you know, because at first they did have a lot going. Yeah, Vince is just totally hates this lieutenant. He does not trust him. He thinks he's just as bad as all the other questionable cops. <laughs> and and then they just toss that out. They're like, Yeah, we get along. I'm like, well. Okay, so he's clearly not a suspect. He's clearly a good guy. And he's dating Jane's mom, so that's getting even more awkward. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's like, then they just are instantly awarding her. And it's like, I mean, I guess that works by diehard for logic. I know. I just remember National Geographic doing specials on fact versus fiction, and they did one on, you know, can John McClane actually, you know, shoot himself through the shoulder and kill the bad guy? And it's like, uh, absolutely not (laughs) all he did was shoot his shoulder and probably fracture his entire career but you know works for a deliberately over the top movie doesn't necessarily work for a real life thing and so i guess i don't know i don't know if they realized that was so unrealistic and they just wanted to write over that because that's kind of what a lot of writers do whatever they find less interesting they just try and just alleviate and or if I don't know, maybe they. I am just speculating here. Maybe they could. Oh. Maybe they figured. We we just can't see 
anywhere where this story actually works and is interesting and becomes woe is me if Jane is just, you know, in a cane and just walking around the whole season. It's just not going to work. So <laughs> for our kind of show. So maybe they just decided, yeah, let's just award her because no other show really starts that way, to be fair, where someone gets injured and they award them. Usually they're just in a hospital bed for three episodes and then go back to the line of duty. So I guess they just wanted to show here's how far she's come and here's uh she, she's just that badass <laughs> well and we never got to see her in a hospital bed yeah <laughs> she's too good for the hospital <laughs> right they went off in the we didn't even see her get into the ambulance did we nah, I, I sure as hell did it yeah i just saw more uh, jane go or mora go no jane <laughs> right and it just kind of ended there and then three months later mora's at her apartment trying to get her up off the couch to go to the awards thing it's like well, wait a minute, you know, the parents got divorced during that time. There was the two kids in the hospital. And, but then that's me liking the characters and not so much the crime, but you still, I mean, someone could have been over Marino that Marino was working for. So they could have drugged that story out a couple more episodes and, you know, gave us some of that Jane being in the hospital and having to have multiple surgeries and, you know what happened with Frankie and yeah uh, all the stuff yeah. that does happen like when they're going with Maura's adapted mom you know played by Jacqueline Bazad and even Dean the FBI agent who's dates Jane and then they just kind of don't have that storyline out I mean it seems like everything they just tested and if they got enough of a reaction they revisited it and it's like it seemed like the one that was getting the most reaction was Patty you know her hitman father <laughs> Yep, she tries, yeah, and the mom that played excellently by Sharon Lords. Uh, that that storyline was really rewarding. Uh, what's your take on the stalker Alice Sands role, where she was like a police academy dropout and had been a high school pal, and she just kind of had always been unstable and just kind of wanted to be like Jane, <laughs> just basically. So, now I like that because that story actually did drag out over episodes just like the Hoyt serial killer he was like, right he was already played excellently by Michael Massey and here she, uh, Sands was played by Annabeth Gesh of West Wing and X-Files fame is like yeah <laughs> I totally buy that persona because she can play those kinds of characters and seem normal but are anything but <laughs> but I mean I thought they did a pretty good job of that I mean was the storyline realistic well, maybe not so much. Some of it, yes, and some of it, no. But she could, I guess, have those underground connections, you know, with all the, the people that lived in the sewers and that. And, you know, they could have all that mapped out. But would she have that if she was working in Canada? Or was she working in Canada? You know, it's just, there was a lot of unanswered questions. Yeah. With that storyline that had we known more details, I mean, where had she been all that time? Yes, she had these businesses, but she wasn't living in the underground, you know, all that time. So would she have formed those relationships? Yeah. have all those kids following her like that. A little backstory would have been better on that. Um, I mean, the crime ring is definitely what makes it stand out. And like you say, I mean, it would have, it could have, it, it definitely took a while. And it did make you wonder, has she been doing this ever since she's dropped out of the academy? Or are they just a plot hole there and they're just paying too much detail to who killed who and who kidnapped who. <laughs> um, right. I will admit, I do think Jane, I mean, the show leaves you wondering if she, you know, killed just in line of duty or act of vengeance. But uh, me and my mother did have a problem with that, how, you know, she's holding him, you know, uh, you know, the teenager hostage and, you know, Jane just finally just bursts in just puts her total career on the line it's like yeah i think realistically they would have kidnapped her and or that they would have arrested her and she would have probably gotten away or something because of lack of evidence or just given how real life justice works it's just i i don't think she would have just gone in guns blazing it works for a show but then you kind of got to have some kind of review like hey you're, you're on temporary you know paid leave or something mm -hmm. like that Instead, they're just like, nope, killed her. She's a psycho. <laughs> like, well, there's still a process to how this all works. If, typically, if you're somehow related to someone in, who's committing a crime, they typically don't let you get involved with the case. <laughs> so, felt like that was a little suspension of disbelief. It's like, okay. 
there is a mo modus operandi to how law enforcement works, guys. I think realistically, Vince and Frankie would go in and and Sands would probably start, you know, d given her stalker background would have said, oh, I know you're related to Jay, you know, <laughs> and try and take advantage of that. And then, you know, obviously they could go and blaze it with a SWAT team, but <laughs> I don't think Jane would risk putting all that and be questioned later, but they don't even kind of talk about it afterwards. They're just like, yeah, she's dead. <laughs> there is no investigation afterwards or talk right. about it, about how this messy affair even happened to begin with. It's like, well, you saved a teenager. That's good enough for us. <laughs> but I mean, Jane's character at that time was so traumatized by Alice Sands that she she shouldn't even have been on the case. No, they, they don't let any. I mean, it doesn't take much for detectives to profile each other and <laughs> say, uh, you know, no, don't take it personally. I just know you're related to this case, so you're off of it. <laughs> Which is what they did with Hoyt. You know, they took her off, and then Jane tried pleading with them, you know, to, to let her do the Hoyt thing. And when we were talking <laughs> about uh, um, Korzak earlier, I wanted to mention how it always came off that Jane was always in charge, even though Korzak was the sergeant and over her, it's like Jane always took the lead. And I know sometimes she might have been the lead detective on the case and that would be her role, but it seemed like she did it all the time. You know, well, let's do this. And, you know, yeah. And, and they, they just of, ruled with it. And they kind of imply that it's like he's kind of, yeah, he's more of the sergeant and then it became a lieutenant by season five. But yeah, it's like because he's technically the partner, he's like, well, I'm presiding. Just don't. Eh, I'll I'll let you carry it. Just don't go out of bounds. <laughs> but yeah, they kind of keep it brief at first because they're like, you didn't know if the writers needed to read up on police uh, ranks or what. But it's like, hey, it is what it is. <laughs> yep, she was the lead detective. Boom. It's like, well, she wasn't the lead detective every single time. So it's <laughs> like, I mean, if you want to get technical, I don't know if you've looked up the role of the chief medical examiner in the state of Massachusetts, but. <laughs> I'm sure there's protocol to that too. It's like, yeah, isn't, doesn't Mora have to have like some other person presiding over her? Like, aren't there supposed to be two medics in the room at once or? <laughs> well, she wouldn't have been doing everything that she's doing. Because yes, the chief medical go. examiner is the administrator. There you go. She's, I mean, if you go back to Crossing Jordan, you know how... Mm -hmm. um, also in Boston. <laughs> right, uh, which was kind of weird. That's also Boston. But she was the medical examiner. Jordan was. But she had a boss right there. So oh. who was the boss? The boss was probably the chief medical examiner who had to do all the paperwork and do all the stuff. And that is... Mora was the chief medical examiner. She wasn't simply the medical examiner. You yeah. know, you have the regional medical examiners throughout the state of Massachusetts, and they all report to the office of the chief medical examiner. So when you read, because I think I told you I do fan fiction writing. Mm -hmm. And so when I get into my stories, it's like I research. It's like, okay, what is the role of the chief medical examiner? It's like, holy shit, they got that wrong, like, by a lot. They should have just called her a medical examiner, you know, that she was assigned <laughs> to that area, and then she would be doing what she was doing. But as the chief medical examiner, I mean, I looked up the stats, I think it was for 2019, she only did 10 autopsies. <laughs> yeah, probably would have done more than that. And like the you whole say, year. Like you but, say, they kind of get away with it but it is a lot to have to kind of believe because it's like, yeah, I get that writers will only just kind of focus on five characters, which is basically it, you know, Vince and uh, Frankie, Jane and Laura. And at that time also <clears throat> uh, Barry. So it's like, but at the same time, it's like, that is a lot of paperwork. That's not, and they kind of get away with it because it's like, she doesn't really have much of a life. She just kind of does her own, you know, scientific stuff that she wants to do. And, <laughs> uh, but, and gives Jane stuff that suggests stuff for Jane to do from afar. But it's like, yeah, if you're in charge of it all, you really aren't having much of a life. So <laughs> I don't know how you're keeping all this together. So. <laughs> yep. And she would have been, Maura would have been giving more stuff to Susie to do that. You actually see Maura in the lab 
you know, actually running some of the tests and it's like, okay, we'll go back to, she's a medical examiner. And so what I tried to do to make it more realistic in my fanfic was I said that she's the medical examiner for the Boston police department for right there. Yeah. And, a, a whole. <laughs> yeah, and the chief medical examiner and that they're understaffed and they need to find more medical examiners. So in the meantime, she's functioning as the medical examiner as well as the chief medical examiner. There you go. Okay. <laughs> so, and had they did that in the series, it would have been, you know, more convincing for someone like me who actually goes out and looks up what these people's job descriptions are. <laughs> and I think the detective wise, you know, they did it, they did it good. You had a team of two. So you had Frost and Jane, and then they worked with Korzak, their sergeant. And when you look up the Boston Police Department and you look up the different divisions, that's how it is. Mm -hmm. You have two or three detectives working underneath the sergeant. And then you have like six to eight teams, you know, depending. And you have your night teams and your day teams and, you know, all that. So they did good with that. And Angie Harmon says that she actually went to the Boston, you know, police department and actually worked with them. And so, you know, I don't know how much the writers or any of that research, all that, but, um, and I don't know if they let Angie have any feedback in any of that. I've seen some other shows where the artists, the artists, the actors get feedback, you know, on their character and how, and the people that are writing the show actually listen to them and incorporate it and change it up a bit you know, to go with the realism of the situation. Totally. So I don't know if Angie got to actually do that. I mean, she said she did the research so she could do the role, but I don't know if she got a voice in how the role was portrayed once she got there. So that would have been interesting to read about that, but I never saw, you never see the, the other side of that. You hear Angie talk about she did that, but did anybody use what she learned to help her build the character or does she just have to portray the character as it was written and that's it yeah i give them notes afterwards like i mean actors do have a say in that you know producers will take seriously like don't invite that director back he was you know focusing mm -hmm. on just needless you know just random stylish shots and not telling the story or arguing over what the characters do you know which we and we know the character you know don't tell an actor they don't know the character when they've been on the show for years so you know, right. uh, and writers do often write, you know, start writing when they got the character's voice in their head. But yeah, it does make you wonder. It's like, well, what was their say? Because wasn't she an executive producer later on? Or Yeah, they both did. They both um, did a show. Okay, and so they, he got to do the 100th episode. And I think Sasha did the, the last episode and maybe a few of the last episodes. Okay, yeah, so they definitely had some say if they're executive producers. So yeah, like I can say this about the character and flesh that out, add that note, you know. I get to but play you're talking the hundredth episode. There were only 105 episodes. So I mean, they're not getting that say until the very end. Oh, okay. Oh well shit. So <laughs> it's not like they got to do it like on episode ten or whatever. And you know So maybe that was just it. Maybe they were just cool with whatever and they're like, Hey, can I just have a say on one episode? <laughs> I mean, I know some shows, you know, where they, where the executive producers actually sat down with the actors and said, you know, what do you think about this? What's, what's your feedback? And, you know, how can we improve that? And they actually felt like they had some ownership in their character and they've, you know, they could go to that producer and say, Hey, you know, I think we should do this instead of this. And then they think about it and they actually do that. And it's like, that's, that's kind of cool. <laughs> I'm not in the acting career field at all. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know how all this works. And, and I mean, it varies by set to set, you know, what, and that's sometimes when you get kind of some problems like behind the scenes creatively where people are used to doing it this way on some set versus that one. So that's why you'll have some people storming off because you're like, okay, so I don't get this level of, I don't get to share my two cents on this show versus this other show. <laughs> and I guess if I ever finish my book and it gets picked up, to be a movie or TV, then then I'll learn more. But hey, get, keep picking writers' brains on Twitter. They're looking for new people to add to their staff. <laughs> it's the fun of being retired. I can pretty much do what I want. And exactly. Research all day long. <laughs> and 
and I mean, they're looking for fans just like themselves who, you know, <laughs> know the characters inside and out. Um, if they ever do a reunion, maybe you could write it. Because <laughs> um, I know I, I really was surprised that they didn't do one because it seemed like every other show or movie crew was doing some Zoom get togethers and reunions when COVID first hit just to kind of, you know, <laughs> kill some time and have fun. <laughs> I would like to see him reboot the show, bring it back, you know, 10 uh, years later or whatever. And what would it look like? Because it seems like <laughs> they did it now. I guess you could, you know, Jane's working for the FBI now and Mora did more of a I mean, you could really, you could pick it up. They go to Paris for 30 days and it's like, what happens? I mean, I don't know if you ever read any of the fan fiction. There's some great stories out I, there. I didn't see mm -hmm. any of the ones you forwarded to me yet, but I used to read some back in the day. But yeah, um, I mean, there's some great stories about what what could happen. They could go on vacation for 30 days and you know come back and decide, hey, we really we don't want to change this. We can still be us and be our dynamic, even though Vince is retired and you know Susie's no longer with us and Barry's no longer with us. They're there's still you and I, and we can still with Frankie and you know yeah. some of the other new detectives, we can pick up and still make the Boston. Yeah, real department. realistically, yeah, Vince is totally living a happy life in with Kiki. <laughs> yep, running the dirty robber. Yep. There you go. And that was an interesting storyline to just see them get involved with that restaurant that Jane's mom was a part of, let alone how Kiki had to come to understand. He's like, I'm not just marrying anyone. I'm marrying someone who's been married three times and who is a cop. So I accept this responsibility, let alone this dangerous lifestyle. <laughs> well, and she's marrying into that cop family too. Yeah. Because Vince is part of a, you know, very serious family that's been together for a while. Yeah, he's a Vietnam veteran too. So yeah, he's like, right. he, he has lots of respect points and street cred. And he's like, well, okay. I, well, I know. they did it. A good job of depicting that too that you know you're not just in this by yourself it's not a nine to five job i mean you're you're together you know and you're you're working and it's so funny how they showed her wedding being crashed is like because it made the story it didn't feel like the storylines you know weren't actually connected to each other it's like no it all connects to one another you know it's connected to alice sands and all those other awful criminals that are you know taunting the detectives <laughs> it's like yeah so this wedding is already kind of going to shit, even though a lot of people are putting some serious effort to it. And it's like, well, and that's the final nail in the coffin. So it's like, yeah, no, not going to let this get in the way. Still going to get married. But you guys better yes, solve this crime case. As Jane runs off down the street barefoot, with she didn't have a gun, I don't think, either. <laughs> she, didn't, she didn't have her gun on her. I just kind of complimented her tomboy attitude. She's like, I'll go anywhere, anytime. <laughs> yeah. Thank for more. What do you think of the show, how it's kind of been regarded as a pretty highly by the LGBTQ community, even though that her character is, you know, that close. It's just kind of just shows you how every show kind of takes on its own identity. It's kind of become big in that community because of just what camaraderie both characters add to one another. <laughs> so as I said, I'm, I'm writing a book. So I started researching and that's how I got back into Rizzoli and Isles. And as I was doing my reading up on Rizzoli and Isles, because I was looking for the cop and who she has the um, work associations with. And then I had, well, medical examiners, like, let's take a look at that. Let me look at Rizzoli and Isles again. <laughs> and I had heard that from the LGTB community that they thought that, you know, the characters were gay and it was queer baiting and all that. And I thought about it and it's like, whoa, what, what are you talking about? So I started watching it again with that in mind. It's like, are they, and the more I watched it, it's like, they are really friendly. But then I thought about my friendship with my women friends. And it's like, no, we're that. They're just tight. close. <laughs> and I'm not a lesbian. And I have, I sleep in the same bed with my best friend. When we go, we were working with a youth group and would go to a convention and that. And it's like, we would have to share a bed and there was no. I mean, there's a reason they keep lockers separate. I mean, guys get along with guys, girls get along with girls. You know, it's just like gym class. So it's like, yeah, I, I, I never got any of that from the show. I just was like, 
Yeah, they're just they're just sisters from other mothers. That's, that's but when are. I went back looking at it, I <laughs> could see where it could get picked up that way. Especially early on when no one knew where the show was going to go. It was like, yeah, you know, Laura's pretty playful and Jane is really tight and very tough, you know. <laughs> they're opposites, but yet they're very compatible. They could easily become either of those stereotypes because they kind of got some of those traits. So it's like, yeah, it, you run the risk of having any kind of interpretation when you take on any kind of role. And it's like, well, that's part of acting, guys. You interpret stuff. <laughs> but, but like I said, I can see it. And I, I am straight, but after reading what I read and then going and watching the show and then trying to look at it from that perspective, yeah, I could see how they could feel that way about the show, that they, sh they could have been a couple. And especially with them showing all their failed relationships, you know, and that's why in one of my stories, I, well, in all of my stories, actually, Jane and Maura end up together because now I, I got on that train and it's like, yeah. <laughs> nice. It's Very like, cool. I mean, it, they, if they ever reboot the show, you know, it won't happen that way. They'll more, more will get married and have kids and, you know, Jane will still be her best friend. And, but people would still take them that way. Even I, the, the community and, would still love to have the show come back, even if they come back still as straight best friends. Oh, totally. And you would like to see them kind of get some kind of happiness. And I mean, in the final episode, it was good that they kind of did just a fun, quick clip show. And they did it. They picked some really good clips and highlights, I thought, instead of mm -hmm. just, well, you know, because other shows that have done clip shows, often they just kind of would just pace it out very generically. It was like, okay, I've already seen that. This isn't even entertaining anymore. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is the way they did the clips. It's like, okay, I, that's a good way of remembering that key point in the show arc. Or, yeah, that was a funny scene. That's fun, glad you included that in there. <laughs> and so you can picture Jane going off to the FBA, FBI Academy, though, because they did a show where she went and did a guest time there and so you can actually picture her going off and doing that but then that brings you to another show that the person did that <laughs> Castle with Kate Beckett there you go and my, maybe that was their you know I kind of got that just on the closer when one of the wacky detectives was putting up a pineapple and I was like maybe they're making a reference to Psych which was on at the same time so yeah those were on around the same time as Castle so maybe that was the maybe the writers were a fan of Kate Beckett and they're like yeah uh, we want Jane to be like Kate Beckett if we ever do a spinoff <laughs> with another show. <laughs> well and that was a whole nother article I read too which one's the better cop Olivia Benson or Jane Rizzoli and it's like oh those are my two favorites. <laughs> Apples and oranges I, I, I mean I like how Vincent is now like a captain, you know, on, on SVU. But she, I mean, I can see her having her and Jane having a good respect for each other. But I mean, you can't compare the two. I mean, yeah. they, I they, could they, see them working together, though. Totally, it'd be awesome, especially seeing <laughs> as close as you get as Andy Harmon as <laughs> her character on Law and Order SVU yeah. the first season. But yeah, that's it. Um, that would have been a cool crossover. Um, what's the other one? I'm, I, I can see if they brought it back. I just hope they wouldn't do the billionth uh, taken man on fire knockoff. I would hate for more to be kidnapped in Paris and Jane go on a you know one man army pursuit. That would just be stupid. I, I would hope that she would be just like an established FBI trainer or something like that. You know, just some high ranking official doesn't necessarily do anything besides just simple office work and get results from afar you know she should be the person who's just on a view screen seeing a field ops team do a takedown she doesn't have to be in the field anymore <laughs> yeah but see castle did that paris kidnapping thing with castle's oh, I, daughter I, getting kidnapped. i totally forgot about that <laughs> it seemed like it was all the rage at the time everyone had to get kidnapped in europe i'm like it's not well, that's thing. as i sit here and i look at these different shows and what they've done it's like yeah okay that's why i started writing things down of what i'm seeing in the different shows and it's like yeah <laughs> they did that but rizzoli and isles never promoted jane 
So in seven years, you know, for the show to run, but I do think they did have her take the exam. I thought she took the sergeant's she, exam. She definitely the took it. I, I do recall her taking the sergeant exam, and I just don't know if they weren't sure where to proceed at that point. Because, yeah, Corsac, he was successful. So I guess they just said. Right. Hey, and Corsac yeah. was retiring. So they left it. I mean, this is how I remember it is that Jane took the test and then she decided to go to the FBI. But if they were ever going to bring it back, they could bring it back that Jane took the test, passed the test, you know, should have to do all her requalifying with the gun and all that and get accepted back to BPD. And then boom, she's a sergeant working homicide. And then it'd be cool to see her promoted up to lieutenant. Because with her mindset and the way she pieces things together and does things, should be great at running several teams, you know, with with the different homicides. Oh, but yeah. then you think about how many homicides actually happen in Boston in a year. And it's like when you look up the statistics, I mean, some years, you know, they have 40 something, some they have 50, 60, 70. So it's not like you're going to have a homicide, you know, every week. <laughs> yeah. And when you look at how many homicide teams you have, and of course the homicide's not solved in a 45 minute period. <laughs> it takes sometimes weeks, months, and sometimes they go unsolved. You know, they become cold cases. Right. And they're, they're still solving those when you look at just I can't say that word, statistics. <laughs> you know, they're still working on the cold cases in between when they don't have an active case. And they actually have a whole cold case division, which is a whole nother show, which I watch too and love. Yeah, it's also on Star TV often before <laughs> reruns of that. So yeah, it is a kind of cool parallel. Um, and I think, if anything, I think uh, cold case is a good example on how a case can stand on its own. And Russian Gordon and Rizzoli and even the closer were a good example of how you can have something for everybody. You can do stand load cases while still doing, you know, serialized storytelling <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and, you know, characters that everyone relates to. All the guys are watching it just as much as girls and vice versa. And uh, uh, there's such intelligent conversation, you know, it's like, the, mm -hmm. you know, I, I get turned off in fiction when I feel like, a character I'm I've been following isn't affected at anything, you know, throughout the storyline, or if it's just repetitive as hell and it doesn't work too well. I'm gonna think they didn't ever show Jane not solving a case, did they? I'm trying to remember. And they they would often just kind of it was shared. Like she would either start it or she'd end it. Barry and Vince would get the evidence for her and she'd go in and, you know, take down the ser serial bomber or serial killer. But I don't think they ever had a case go cold. And I guess that wouldn't be good TV to do that because you have no closure, but yeah. it would have been realistic. They did it with the closer a few different times and it was often just, they would, but they would at least hint at it. Like this, this person was, you know, this case was dead before we even got it, you know, like this body's been at the bottom of this pool this whole time, or <laughs> the, the, this person was a walking train wreck. But like you say, is like, you can't do that every episode. You got to have like either like a two, a very explosive two parter is like, okay, I've taken this dangerous person down. And now I'm going to see them in court, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. stare at them while they're this hack lawyer presides in front of the jury trying to tell them this case is baseless, you know. But they, they could have had them bring a cold case up. Oh, they totally could have. And I mean, yeah. like any show, that it definitely got stuff that's inspired by headlines or common cases like rap artists killing their producer or uh, uh, like I especially guffawed at the earlier episode where they're at the Boston Marathon because that, you know, it just established that the show is just so Boston. And to differentiate itself from over the top movies like The Departed and anything else is like, hey, yeah, let's gonna have a crime case, and you know we're doing a common Boston heritage kind of thing, but you know we're, we gotta basically forfeit our time in the race, and we gotta 
we can't cancel the race. There's too many politics involved. So it's like, let's just solve this case because clearly someone wanted to win this race so bad. It's got it. One of the culprits has to be one of the runners. So let's figure out which jogger could have stabbed someone else here. <laughs> it's such a nutty case and yet so carefully planned, so intense because, you know, it's so atypical. <laughs> well, and it makes it where it could seem like it could be realistic. Once you figure yeah. out certain things, it's like, yeah, the logistics of shutting down the race. Couldn't I mean, happen, yeah. Yeah. It, and you would totally lose any sense of believability if you did it like that. It's like, yeah, no, that would be like if you were, if someone got a heart attack who was supposed to perform at a Super Bowl event and then you just said, we got to cancel it. Like, uh, nope, <laughs> you are not going to give refunds to all those sponsors and all those people who want to. The show must go on. The show must go on and exit stage right if you can't make it, but the show must go on. And it's just so funny. And it, it makes sense. There have been, you know, Tanya Harding type, you know, athletes who have decided to make things personal and, you know, be ego headed dicks or even lead to murder. So it's like, yeah, I can totally see something like that happening. I can see someone deciding to be a bad sport who believes they're the best, but believes they won't naturally win. So they decide to shank <laughs> a participant. It's like, yeah, people are crazy. <laughs> So I have a question for you. What did you think about the whole thing of uh, Jane's mom moving into the guest house with Mora? Instant comedy gold. We've all had roommates that we do or don't get along with and rupture feathers. And, you know, I've lived with different family and everyone's had a sense of, you know, I get the, this guest bed this time or I get the bunk bed. And it's just so funny how the arson storyline of, you know, it doesn't mean anything at first. And I like how that became its own recurring mystery is like, oh no, someone did actually have it out. You know, was that Alice Sands or was that someone else? I can't remember. No, Who that was that? part of the Alice Sands. Okay. So, I, but I love that because it didn't become apparent at first. It just seemed like it was a crazy guy. And then they led it back to Alice and it's like that, that was dynamite. That all came together and that blew my mind. And I'm like, but like you say, it's just so hysterical. Now. <laughs> it was like more is like, and, Jane's mom is totally getting along and Jane is like, ah, I, why would you do that? <laughs> I don't, what don't you get? I need my space. I don't want her telling me you work too hard. You don't eat enough. I don't, I, I, I don't want that every day. I need some space. And it just shows you, it's like, I mean, I, we all have our moments where it's like, okay, well, so-and-so needs a timeout or so-and-so just, you know, talk to them at six o'clock. They just, they need that alone time. And at the same time is like, it's just so funny how they kind of go back and forth is like uh, when the other brothers, they don't know, you know, you know, when they're telling the youngest to start being a man and start, you know, whether this is your baby or not, you know, you're with this girl more, so you should be a supportive father. And, you know, <laughs> uh, I also liked how Frankie had to just kind of figure out, you know, it's like, what he wanted to do pursue in life is like, okay, now I got my, my sister and I got each other's backs. I can have some fun too. I don't have to ask permission. You know, I can actually have a life too. <laughs> yeah. I liked when they, they put him and Nina together, but I think all that kind of happened kind of fast too. Yeah. At, at first it seems fun. And then it seemed like it was kind of a rushed gag. And it's like, okay, well, what's going on here guys? <laughs> yeah, looking through the telescope and it's like will you marry me it's like whoa wait a minute it's kind of kind of fast there yeah i mean don't get me wrong love is a dangerous thing but that that was a little a bit hackneyed near the end it's like yeah that, that needs some serious fleshing out before it deserved that kind of send off it's like i don't know if the writers were second guessing what their audience was or how to write that scene but yeah it's like eh. So it, any any shortcomings it has though are just easily outdone by the positives. It out. Oh yeah. It never becomes formulaic. It always has something fresh and new. It's always energetic, which is better than nothing at all. Because I hate. Don't you hate it when a show just kind of just grinds to a very awkward halt and then just never gets that momentum back? 
it right. never it never had moments like that it never had moments where i'm like i so want to skip this episode i fucking hate it you know it never had moments like that it well never... and i still watch it i mean i've yeah. watched the whole series through multiple times and you know it's on my apple tv i can watch it whenever i want so. yeah because that's the beauty of hbo max when and when that announced i did light up i'm like guys you don't realize that they're not just taking anything from that channel. They're taking anything from the Warner Brothers, you know, TNT vault. So it includes that closer. Yeah. Uh, I'll definitely watch these multiple times. I'll, you know, give it 10 years. I'll watch it again. Uh, I mean, I always try and, you know, I'm already catching up on numerous other shows to begin with. But yeah, it's like these shows, they definitely have a huge audience. And it's just a matter of who you talk to. I'm sure from what forums I vaguely recall watching, it seemed like fans of the book were cool with the show. They just really dug how it seemed like they had the style. They just kind of, their license was with how they portrayed the characters. And it's like, well, so the character might be different, but the cast is dynamite. So it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. It's not like a Tom Cruise who looks nothing at all like Jack Reacher. And where the movies, instead of becoming a fun fugitive, if you read the books, they're definitely something like what you would see on an episode of 24 or something. Mm -hmm. And even a Tom Clancy novel, just dynamite reading can't no holds barred suspense. Like I was even picking my sister up from college one day and I just went to the library and I read one of those Jack Reacher books. And I was just like, uh, uh, can, I, can you stall yourself in class one more hour so I can finish this finish book? The book. <laughs> but yeah. It was like, you watch the movies. It's like, okay ho-hum they're okay they're not must see they're just tom cruise doing mission impossible but without the mission impossible brand <laughs> it's just, you know so. what i would have liked to have seen sasha alexander do patricia cromwell is working on scarpetta oh they were casting that and she asked on i don't know if it was instagram or facebook who would you like to see play k scarpetta <laughs> and I, of course, that Sasha Anderson, I mean, Alexander, she would be perfect for it. And she's right. been a medical examiner. And when all. you're dealing with an examiner, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it'd be perfect for her. And you could picture her moving into that role. And, you know, it's just, but they cast Jamie Lee Curtis. I was like, okay. It's I mean, I like Jamie Lee Curtis, don't get me wrong, but I think Sasha alexander would have been perfect for that yeah that is what i have liked about twitter where you see them actually kind of pick their fans brains but then there are, are other ones where it's like wait what where did that you know casting come from or did it even matter to begin with was the producer well, i think say, it was already cast before they asked us because <sighs> the announcement was made you know not that far later yeah so they're just trying to get some clicks versus actually caring about the question <laughs> Just trying to get it out there that hey, Scarpetta's actually going to come to life. You know, <sighs> that's annoying. <laughs> you don't like it? Well, I I, li I like the casting and all. I just hate the whole kind of asking a question that really doesn't actually matter. Oh. I think that I think that's a waste of social media. I I like it when there's legit questions and. Well, I mean, it might have been legit. It just seemed like the announcement of the casting was. Okay, Not well, that's that fair. I could be wrong, too. Maybe she did legit care, and the investor or producers had other ideas, and they didn't coincide. And, like, and they may like, have tossed some of those popular ones up. I know a lot of people clicked like on mine, you know, so there's a lot of Sasha fans out there that, oh, yeah. Hell yeah. Put her as K Scarpetta. Because, I mean, they can go, you know, a lot of places with Scarpetta. There's well, so many books. And truth be told, I think a lot of people, my, my late grandmother uh, was always into crime mystery and shows, and she never saw that show. I think it, yeah, it was before it was coming out right as she was unfortunately passing away, but she liked the closer and everything. But yeah, if you were to show these faces in front of her, she instantly like, like recognized them. Like she saw Angie Harmon on a hysterical episode as a villain of the week on Chuck, and she's like, I know that guy. Oh, yeah, yeah, she was on Law and Order and Women's Murder Club. <laughs> And I know if I brought up Kate, she'd be like, oh, Kate, like on NCIS, Kate? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so, unless you mean Beckett, but yeah. It's like, it's like it, she would totally recognize both those names. So I think that was also kind of the winning formula is like 
they were both pretty underrated names who were had already kind of done they had already broken through and so is this next stage of your career is like by this time both these these actors actresses are immortal <laughs> mm-hmm. it was like Sasha is always kind of guest starring on a bunch of other shows and independent films and I haven't seen anything from Angie besides that Voltron thing that she well, did, did some voiceovers but I she mean, wanted to be um, She-Hulk Angie did oh, really? really big article that she was promoting herself to be She-Hulk and oh, nice and it, it actually it went to a black actress so they're going a totally different way with it that it's like that would have been cool for her to be the She-Hulk. Oh, I do remember that now. Yeah, that was a historical Conan interview. <laughs> she even had the costume she wore for Halloween. Oh, I didn't time. see that. I'd love to see that. Yeah, but... they post. I'm sure if you do an internet search, you can find a picture of her in the the Hulk costume. You know. Oh, let me look it up. <laughs> it's like that. That would. Oh, been I cool. see it now. Nice. <laughs> That's awesome. Find it. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah, but that would have been a whole nother genre for her to go into a superhero. <laughs> well, I mean, Jane Ro- Jane Rizzoli's, you know, a superhero, but yeah, uh, I mean, they kind of almost come close to that on the show by doing some like costume design kind of choices. Like, uh, I love it when Frankie and Barry are arguing over, you know, their yard sale, and it's like <laughs> he's uh his mother gives away like a toy robot that was one of Frankie's favorites and like Barry buys it for like a oh, yeah. hundred bucks or something. I was like, that's great. Cause everyone can relate to something like that. It was like, ah, he gave away my favorite VHS or my favorite book, you know, to have my books or some shit like that. It's like, and yeah. I always had that gist where it's like parents were trying to get rid of stuff. I'm like, okay, just cause I don't use it doesn't mean I don't love it. <laughs> so I, I do love that gist of it. It's like, and I used to always go buy yard sales, but I had no concept of money. I was that young. And it's like, my parents are like, don't go to the yard sale because then I have to retrieve you and then buy something there. <laughs> you know, my sister bugged me one time. Why do you buy so many cameras? And it's like, oh my God, there's so many different types of cameras. And some of them are antique. And it's like, some of them you can't even buy film for. You have to use photo paper and do the exposure yeah. just right and go to the dark room. And she's like, that's too much work. I'll take uh, my phone out and take my picture. Yeah, I'll see. I, I still miss Kodak cameras. I thought those were so fun how you had the photo right there in your hand. But yeah, it is like people also need to realize just because you're even buying certain stuff, maybe you want to make your own museum. Maybe you want to donate it to some kind of cause. Maybe you want to sell it as a collector's item for choices value. There's plenty of reasons for why people buy use antiques and other stuff. And there is that's your passion it was like my passion is kind of buying rare (laughs) hard to get vhs tapes or collectors that have transferred them to dvd so to speak i don't do that all the time because that's expensive as hell but um we all got our own passion i like finding rare everyone likes to just show off hey i just bought this new expensive blu-ray pack i'm like yeah whatever I'd, i'd be more impressed if you bought you know one that was not only hard to find, but has like multiple different cuts of a movie that's, you know, been supposedly lost the time or was known for having different versions you know, of one big concise narrative, put a trouble production, made it hard to find or something like that. Just show it. Uh, I'm more into just kind of cult film history. But yeah, I mean, photographs is definitely another interesting thing in that you're learning to appreciate the art that goes into it. And you know, and again, I think you can say most certainly, I mean, digital has not only enhanced reality, but it has just spoiled so many millennials who just seem to think, you know, I'm a millennial myself, but I know enough that, hey, you know, this is, I had enough people reminding me along the way that, you know, not everything is, you know, just solved with a simple click or just turning on a digital oven is like there, there's a lot of stuff you still got to know how to do manually because you know if the world goes to shit there's going to be a lot of people who just like i give up life you know i don't i don't know how everything else works and 
with taking a photo is like, yeah, the phone option has just really spoiled everyone, I think. It is. It's such an instant society. I can, well, exactly. It's like, yeah, I, I can take it. It's there. If I don't like it, I can retake it again or I can digitally enhance it. It was like, <laughs> you see, you don't realize everyone else didn't have that option. They had to go into the dark room. <laughs> I remember out. when we got push button phones and we didn't have to do the rotary dial phone. Mm -hmm. I, I'm aging myself now, but it's like, holy crap, that was so nice to be able to just push the button. <laughs> I <laughs> still miss flip phones, hell. <laughs> huh? I still miss flip phones, hell. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, my first cell phone was a flip phone. It's like, I think for the longest time I had the old fashioned Nokia, so I took really shitty photos. <laughs> I remember when photos became an option on a phone. Right. I, I did not want to upgrade. I was a geezer in the phone world before everyone just finally said, you should just upgrade to the family plan. I'm like, I guess I don't want to get phones. Oh, so being a technology teacher, I was into technology. I mean, I had a, a cheap digital camera when they first came out, and it's like, playing around with digital stuff. It's like, that was pretty cool. I had to stop doing that though. It gets expensive. Uh, yeah. yeah I, th I think we're all kind of in a bind right now. It's like the stuff we would really typically be doing. We can't do this next few years. You got to buckle down and save money. But I mean, I used to at college, one of my jobs working on campus, in addition to taking classes was uh, I was setting up the VHS projector, making sure it was plugged in the right way. And there was always going to be that one professor who would just not even know how to turn it on. And you would have to instruct them over the phone. <laughs> it's like, everything is plugged up. We made sure to do this before class. Uh, you know, I had an instructor call me. I worked at the education center when I lived in Las Vegas and they nice. called me up and they're like, Hey, Chris, I can't make it to class tonight and I want to show this movie. Can you like set it all up and run the movie and then have them take notes and turn it in? And I'm sitting there thinking, okay. I mean, I was in the class. That's why they picked me. And it's like, I'm not getting paid to do that, but okay, sure. Fine. So yeah. I didn't have it so upset. lucky. Well, I didn't have it so lucky because sometimes <laughs> The equipment would be rented out to another classroom for that day and it's like i'm not going to make a fool of myself and also not be able to unlock your damn computer which was like i can't unlock it anyway because you don't have your password <laughs> that's what unlocks the damn machine and yeah i mean it definitely makes a difference if you're part of the class and that was coming around the time where everyone was getting used to sending video files over email and everyone getting bigger storages for yeah. their digital thing but yeah it's like it, it it does become concerning when it's like we'll ask you to do something and like i can get it to you in an hour i can't get it to you in 20 minutes <laughs> or i i wish you had warned me so i'd have time before your class begun to set this up for you <laughs> oh yeah i'm not a genie in a bottle but Brazilian and Isles sure are <laughs> oh i love that show to me it'll be around forever because I own it. I've got DVD copies of it. I've yeah. got I've got electronic copies in my personal Apple TV, mm -hmm. and I have HBO Max, so it's there. I can watch right. It. If you don't want to take out your disc or your digital yeah. copies, you can just well, start it up on the streaming service, and that's kind of where I am now with all my other stuff I've had over well, the years. And my DVDs, when I can, are being converted on our Plex server so that oh, I nice. can have a digital copy of it. So. I saw that you could do that on Plex and was like, wow, that's definitely an interesting formula. <laughs> Some of my, my, uh, I can't get my Stargate to copy over though. So it's oh, like, dear. Oh. I wanted to do all my sci-fi shows and get them the ones that aren't on, like I can watch, um, all my Star Trek because I have CBS all access. Which, yeah. It's everywhere. <laughs> wait, that's Param Paramount plus now. It's like, so I can mm -hmm. watch those. I don't have to worry about it, but yeah, I mean, my, hell they're even on, for the longest time, they've been on all the Netflix, Hulu, and Prime platforms. I mean, Trek will definitely live on. <laughs> but see, I tried finding Crossing Jordan. It's not on anything. No, only Star TV. And it used to be on Prime for a bit, and then they got taken down. And then it seemed like there was rumors that they were going to release it all on DVD. And it was like it was all a hoax. It's not coming out anytime soon. No, it's on DVD. Oh, yeah, but only season one, I thought. 
No, the whole the whole six seasons. Uh, okay, well then it's, some something it got worked out. Should be arriving at my house today. It's probably downstairs right now, waiting on me to pick up my box off my porch. Uh, even better. Now, if they could do that with Homicide, that'd be even better. <laughs> I love Homicide. Homicide Hunter, Joe Kinda. Oh Is yeah. That what you're about? Uh, oh no no, I'm talking Life on the Street. Oh, I guess I don't know that one. Uh, that that was from the '90s. Had Andre Bragger that's introduced the John Munch character before he was on Law and Order. Mm. No, uh, I haven't seen that one. Oh uh, yeah, well it's hard to get that tracked down, but it's never going to be on streaming because of the music rights and whatever reason. There's just not enough demand, and despite it being in the same universe as Saint Elsewhere and Law and Order, it's just ah, I don't know why. It's just it's got a huge fan base, but. I was able to get the DVDs discounted at 40 bucks and it was so worth it. Uh, it I, I benched for that all and it was just wonderful. <laughs> totally recommend any, anyone who can find a discount on Amazon and eBay. Uh, I, I know you would definitely dig it because it's got a lot of the same kind of just shot on actual location as the place it claims to be in and lab work and the uh, you know off color detectives all helping each other out and mm -hmm. equal opportunity both you know male and female and just showing the uh workplace and uh, uh societal politics behind it all it all said in baltimore and i think in, in many ways you'll after you see it you'll totally see how it kind of influenced crash and jordan some of the other shows i definitely got a vibe for that on the closer especially because just showing all the interconnected systems and just all the writers doing a good job of just, again, characterizing everybody. Um, and I mean, in many ways, that's why I'm doing all these specials on these certain shows. It's just, how can you not? They, they illustrate perfectly how, again, everyone is living and breathing and more or less just, you know, connected instead of just, being just ho hum entertainment, you know, <laughs> and so like you say, as you've already illustrated numerous times, the show is now immortal because <laughs> it's just going to be constantly rediscovered or rewatched. As long as there's fans, it'll be out there, and there's definitely fan base. So, yeah, I I can't imagine it not being uh, talked about in the future. So, thank you ever so much for being on the show and. Come back anytime, Christy. <laughs> okay, sounds good. We'll return after these messages. Hey, feeling down? Feeling low? Not enough podcasts about movies in your life? Why not try? They must be destroyed on sight! The new Podcast Cure All, sure to get you right with the world and on a path to better living. We have exploitation, we have Italian horror, we have zombies, we have slashers, we have crime films, we have spaghetti westerns, we even have sci-fi and sex comedies. So take a dose of... They must be destroyed on sight! As needed, and let the hosts, Lee Russell, Daniel Harper, Paul Romali, and the odd guest host, Cure What Ails Ya. Warning, may cause atrophy, African consumption, black fever, bone shave, chin puff, colic, cramp colic, Dropsy of the brain, elephantitis, grocer's itch, jaundice, mania, miasma, mortification, palsy, pox disease, rheumatism, scurvy, St. Anthony's fire, summer complaint, and worm fit in some people. Consult a physician before listening. Hey, I heard you like movies. I heard you like to hustle. I heard you like podcasts. Well, guess what? There's a podcast for you out there called The Home Video Hustle. Damn right. Every Friday, we talk about whatever movie PJ picks out the bag. What does that mean? Every Wednesday on our YouTube page, I put a bunch of movies in a bag, and PJ picks one out at random. Mm -hmm. And then we just watch it. We talk about it for maybe like an hour, hour and a half, two hours. Whatever we feel like doing, wherever the conversation leads us. But do we actually talk about the movie? Most of the time. Ah. Tangents galore. Yes. So believe me, we may be a movie podcast, but it's not always about movies. We might talk about video games. Mm -hmm. Music. music. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's mm -hmm. the big one, music. <laughs> uh, sometimes we might get a little bit of politicalness in there. Yes. Sometimes we may just, oh, we know what we like to do. We like to tell stories, PJ. Ah, yes. I am the master storyteller <laughs> yes. of the podcast realm. 
undefeated. So if you like to hear about movies, video games, whatever foolishness comes to our mind, the most random stuff you can think of, check out the Home Video Hustle. You can find us on the Stitchers. Yes. The Google Play. Yes. Apple Podcasts. What else? Podbean. What else? Podcast Addict. Goddamn. All that. Ain't no reason you can't get your hustle on. We everywhere. Worldwide, baby. Hustle mother. Hustle. Hey, we can't cuss in the promo, PJ. Ah. We gotta be family friendly. There may be podcasts out there that don't want us here to say. Ah. 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 All that good fun <laughs> stuff. Well, <laughs> you. Yeah. <laughs> no, don't, don't run the listeners away, PJ. Ah, I'm sorry. But this is going kind of long. Yes. So we'll end this and say, hey, check out the Home Video Hustle every Friday on all the various podcast outlets. Peace. Peace. As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. And while Witch didn't make it to the top of the world, he did make the Gangs of Hollywood podcast. So join the gang and enjoy a movie review podcast about movie gangs, gangsters, mobsters, and the mayhem they cause. You can find GOH Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at gohpod at www.gohpod.com as well as your favorite podcast listening app and remember say hello to your little friend for me If you take two old punk rockers who are past their prime, put them in front of a movie screen and give them a podcast, what do you get? Cinema punks. Cinepunks. It's the mixtape of movies. Did you ever see a film at such a young age it left you traumatized with cinematic wounds? Oh, necrophilia. Oh, oh, oh. It's a dead issue, man. Don't don't push it. Cinema PsyOps is a weekly podcast documenting an ongoing experiment on the mind of an unwilling test subject. No one should have to watch this movie. Oh, no one should have to watch this. No one should have to watch this movie. Surprisingly, it's not a topic that a lot of people really want to tackle. I'm shocked, crude. I know, really. Right? It's the next sexual frontier that no one wants to explore. I am, in the most serious sense, disappointed in you. It takes a powerful goddess like Connie, jam her arm down the monster's throat and kill it. Oh, I'm still tripping out over that. Even as a kid, I was like, I gotta find a girl like that. Every week, I, I get a new look of disappointment that I never thought I could get it's out of. It's unimaginable. At 12 years old, you should not be watching this movie. Obviously. At 13, you should not be. 14, you shouldn't be. I'm not entirely sure even 17-year-olds should be watching this movie. Just because you're offended by something doesn't mean that you have the right to demand that it doesn't exist. Watching this film again, I had all of this, like, little nerd glee with everything that kept Little history up. doll yeah, popping up absolutely. at you. So I totally loved this film. Hey, I know why you, you know, couldn't see that. It's because your brain's warped watching this shit at 12 years old. Yeah, this is this is a rough movie. I told you ahead of time when we were getting ready to do it that it was How did you watch one. this shit at 12? Because physical wounds heal, cinematic ones don't. Listen to Cinema Sion. Hey everybody, I'm Corey. And I'm Zach. And we're the hosts of Podcasting After Dark, a cast dedicated to late night horror and sci-fi of the 80s and 90s, often found on HBO and Cinemax. You know, the movies your parents didn't want you watching as a kid. You can find us every other week on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, and Stitcher. This is what you want. This is what you get. It's late, it's time, let's check our cue, baby Pair it with a couple brews, baby We love your movies, we love the bad ones too So we watch them all and pass their lessons on to you Oh yeah Ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-
Everything I learned from movies Helps to make life a little bit groovy With a one last plot holes a gratuitous movies It's time to get busy With your friend Steven Izzy At eilfm.podbean.com Welcome to Who Was She Podcast. I'm your host, Tara Jabari. After a decade working in documentaries, marketing, and all things digital media, I found that podcasting is a strong medium to share stories. After years of producing for others, I decided to start my own biographical podcast. Who Was She will focus on the life of a woman throughout Baha'i history. The first season is about Lydia Zeminoff. Lydia's story explores the subjects of the power of language and faith. Her father invented the universal language Esperanto, and she came from a Jewish family and became a Baha'i. She grew up during World War I and was killed during World War II in a concentration camp, despite heroic efforts to save her life. How can one person's life intersect with so many others? connect across borders, and inspire a biography which inspired this podcast. Over the next few weeks, I will share her story with you and the lives that were most affected by her and those who affected her life as well. They include her father, Ludwig Semenov, her spiritual mother, American journalist Martha Root, and the Baha'i German soldier Fritz Mako, who worked for the resistance undercover while having to serve the Nazi party. I want to thank the author Wendy Heller and George Ronald Publishing for their blessing to let me use Heller's biography, Lydia, The Life of Lydia Zeminoff, Daughter of Esperanto, as a main and instrumental resource for this podcast. So please subscribe and learn about this amazing woman who traveled through three continents in an effort to bring unity through the power of language. You can also find more information on our Instagram, Facebook, and Pinterest at Who Was She Podcast. Music was composed and performed by Sam Red. I am your host, Tara Jabari. Join us next time as we begin our journey about Lydia Zeminoff. Hi, everybody. It's Mac Jackson. I wanted to invite you to a new site called the Forever Adventure Network. This website has everything. Pictures, videos, blogs. There's original music by Harmony Constant. Two podcasts. One is the MacGyver podcast, where we celebrate Richard Dean Anderson, his iconic roles, and how it's influenced our lives. There's episode discussions, interviews, and life conversations. The second podcast is the Never Gets Old podcast, where we celebrate all the best things that we love in life, from TV, movies, music, and comics. The site is also the home for the MacGyver SG-1 audio series, an ongoing adventure series that continues the adventures of MacGyver and SG-1. There are also multiple stores to choose from for all of your pop culture and adventure needs. Come on by and check us out today. And thanks for joining the adventure. Are you sick of the same old stale podcasts? Well then join Vanessa and Darren as they dissect movies of all kinds. The two lifelong cinema lovers bring their favorites, curiosities, and first-time watches to the operating table and inject them with a healthy dose of snark. Then there's the waiting room, where they examine books and short stories. So just look for them on Apple Podcasts and where fine podcasts are available. They're part of the Legion Podcast Network. Follow them on Twitter at VD Clinic Pod. Join them on Facebook at facebook.com 
slash groups slash VD Clinic Pod or email them at VD Clinic Pod at gmail.com. They're ready to cure what ails you. <laughs> and still, they just might be a little contagious. Hi there. It's Heather from the Watching Netflix Without You podcast. Did you know that there are over 1,200 Netflix original feature films and documentaries? And that number is only growing. So I've made it my mission to watch as many as I possibly can. Then, with a delightful guest or guests, disclaimer, more often than not my brother Ryan, we spend an episode rating, reviewing, and discussing a film at length. The first half of every episode is spoiler-free for those who haven't seen it yet, and in the second half, after a very clear spoiler warning, we dive into it. And that's really about it. You can listen to Watching Netflix Without You on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and more. We now continue with our program. Follow us on the web on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The podcast is available on Podbean, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Anchor, Apple, and anywhere else podcasts are available. Feel free to review our show and leave comments on any of those sites. Thanks a million for listening. It's a jacked up.